work of salvation accomplished. And then immediately afterwards, you see that in verse 17, immediately after his, uh, verse 16, speaking of Christ on the cross, he says in verse 17, and he came and preached peace. And you can track that pattern in other parts of the New Testament. So in the various versions, as it were, of the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Luke and Matthew and John, you can find something similar. You can find a statement about Jesus' great work, his work uh, of giving himself on the cross. And immediately afterwards, uh, mention of the need for that work to be preached, to be proclaimed. Let me give you one example again from the end of Luke's Gospel. I mentioned this yesterday. In Luke 24, the Lord Jesus is with his disciples after the resurrection. He told in verse 45 that he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures and he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. There is the work, isn't it? The work of Christ. The work of salvation. Suffer and rise from the dead. And then, verse 47, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So one follows the other immediately without a break, <laughs> as we have it here in Ephesians chapter 2. It's the same pattern, of course, in the book of Acts. Precisely what was going on there, an the account of the preaching of the gospel to the end of the year, beginning at Jerusalem, immediately following Luke's account of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the broad answer, the big answer to the question, how is God going to implement his plan for world mission, his plan to build his church from every nation under heaven? The answer broadly is through preaching. But then the question arises, this on which I want us to focus this afternoon, the question arises, who preaches? Who is the preacher? And I've got three answers. And the first answer, and in a sense the only answer, the first answer, in a sense the only answer to that question, firstly is, who preaches? The Lord Jesus Christ preaches. Go back to chapter 2, verse 17 of the season. Very interesting, isn't it? Did you notice this? Paul says, very simply, he came, in that verse, he came and preached the peace. He came. Who is that he? Well, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? been the subject of the previous verses, all we've talked about is death. So Paul is saying in verse 17 that Jesus came and preached peace. And who did he preach to? Well, we know from the Gospels, certainly as he preached uh, in the land of Israel, and preached there mainly to Jewish audiences, didn't he? Occasionally <coughs> engaged with Gentiles on an individual basis, but, but very, very largely his ministry was to Jewish people. But here, in verse 17, Paul says, He came and preached peace to you who were far away. And who does he mean by that? Well, clearly he means the Gentiles. He's used exactly the same phrase to describe the Gentiles back in verse 13. <coughs> you who were far away, you were, you were far off, he means the Gentiles. And verse 17, peace to those who were near, peace to the Jews. So, Paul is saying, he's speaking here of Jesus preaching to Gentiles as well as Jews, something which doesn't fit terribly well with the accounts we have of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ while he's alive. <coughs> yeah. So Paul here, he seems to me, is saying something much bigger than that. He's saying that you know, this work of preaching then to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth, to bring in the nations into the church of Jesus Christ, that work of preaching is first and foremost the work of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is Jesus who preaches the gospel to call his people to himself. We have some indication of this, don't we, in, in John's gospel in chapter 10, where Jesus speaks of being the good shepherd. The big theme in that chapter is, is that, uh, as he says, his sheep hear his voice. His voice. And he speaks in that chapter, doesn't he, of, of the other sheep, other sheep who, who are of, from, from another fold, who must bring also in verse 15 
the background. I have other teachers, and often the teacher told I must bring them also. They too will listen, they will hear my voice. He said. There will be one flock and one shepherd. That's precisely what Paul is teaching just here in the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, as we looked at last night. And I'm saying this afternoon that the way in which that happens is through preaching, <coughs> preaching which is first and foremost the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his voice that is sheep across the world, to the left across the world here. <coughs> How we can understand that, can't we, in the context of, again, how Paul conceives of the church. Elsewhere in the New Testament, he speaks of the church as the body of Christ. And we tend to take that as a figure of speech, don't we? Indeed it is a figure of speech, but perhaps it's a little more literal than we, than we are sometimes prepared to take it. It seems to me that the scriptures of the New Testament portray the church in a somewhat more literal sense, not completely literal, of course, but not merely figurative, as the body of Christ, the, the, the members, the parts, as it were, of the body of Christ on earth. His eyes, his ears, his hands, his feet, and his mouth. He speaks through us. Seems to me if you read carefully the letters of Paul and the past of the New Testament, and ask the question of those letters, where in the world today does the unbeliever see Jesus Christ? If an unbeliever wants to, to know Christ, if they want to know what he is like, what his character is, what his attitudes are, as it were, what he teaches, where does the unbeliever, where is the unbeliever to look? The answer that the New Testament gives to that question is very clear. The unbeliever is to look to the church. We are the body of Christ on earth. We are, say this reverently, we are, we are the representation of our Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Where else can the unbeliever look? <coughs> gives us this great sense, doesn't it, of responsibility to fill us with awe and with godly fear. The way we behave, the way our churches operate, is taken by the world around us as representing the one to whom we belong, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is true then of what we say. Jesus Christ is the preacher of the gospel preeminently, and he speaks through us. How does that happen then? Secondly, Jesus Christ is first and foremost the preacher of the good news. Secondly, of course, here in Ephesians chapter 3, it is Paul whose voice is heard and his words are read in his epistle. When Paul preached the gospel, his understanding was that Christ was speaking through him. His understanding of the commission that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ is that Christ preached through him and through his fellow apostles. Of course, it was when people heard Paul preach, it was Paul's voice that they heard, recognized as Paul's voice. It was his mind which was in operation to formulate the words that he would speak. It was his heart that was engaged, it was his passion and zeal which were, which were there and conveyed as he preached. We're not suggesting some kind of um, mind control or also suggestion or anything of that sort. It was Paul who was preaching by his Christ, who was preaching through him. So how precisely does this work? Well, we can see at that from chapter 3 in, in three areas. Firstly, in the <coughs> revelation. revelation. Paul is quite clear, verse 3, talks about the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I've already been reading. Paul did not preach his own thoughts. He didn't preach his own ideas. He didn't 
down with his Old Testament to fix the stuff and scratch his head and say, well, what should I be saying about this? Let's formulate some ideas from this. The message of the gospel that Paul preached was revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. The content of the message that he preached came to him, he said, directly from Christ. He speaks of this in Galatians, that is the Galatians in chapter 1. Sorry, very strongly, there's a verse 11 of that chapter, I want to know, brother, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So the pattern is this, isn't it? That Jesus taught during his earthly ministry, <coughs> but then towards the end, just before he was arrested <coughs> in the upper room, <coughs> his disciples to one side, as it were, speak to them at length, <coughs> many things. But one thing he says is that after he has gone, the Holy Spirit will come and will teach them, he says, all things. And will pray things and pass them on to them so that they can also teach the teaching there in the, in the upper room is clearly indicating that Jesus' <coughs> work of preaching and teaching while he was on earth would be continued through the apostles by the Holy Spirit and that's the case here then with the apostles the good news then is coming to the nation the ends of the earth, through the Apostle Paul and others, on the basis of the revelation of the message that they have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a revelation in relation to Paul's ministry, but there's also a commission. Paul is commissioned by Christ for this purpose, verses 2 and 7. Paul speaks of the administration of God's grace given to me for you. Verse 7, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And uh, Paul was commissioned particularly, wasn't he, as, as an apostle and a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, even at his conversion on the road to Damascus, we, we read of him in Acts chapter 9. Ananias, that faithful disciple in Damascus, <coughs> was given the orphan task, which must have required great courage, to go and speak to Saul, Saul who he knew was just a persecutor, a man who came to Damascus for the purpose of suppressing the church. And the Lord tells him to go to this man for he is praying. Ananias voices some concern about this. And the Lord reassures him in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. He says, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their king and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Paul was very conscious of this. He was conscious that God had commissioned him to preach the gospel, particularly to the Gentiles, not exclusively. Preach the gospel also to the Jews, preach in their synagogues. But he had this particular calling preach to the nations of the world. And so, in Acts chapter 21, when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, <coughs> the opportunity is he by the Roman authorities just to speak to the crowds that have gathered, speak to them, speak to them about their testimony of God, um, and uh, Right at the end of what he said. Well, it wasn't the end of what he intended to say, but it was the end of what he said because the crowd cut him off, drowned him out with their objections. When he said, The Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the Jewish congregate audience there couldn't, couldn't cope with that. The idea salvation to go to the Gentiles in this way is too much for them to drown him out. So Paul had this consciousness then that he was sent particularly to the Gentiles to preach the gospel, that he had a commission from Christ for this purpose. That's absolutely vital, isn't it? We're saying that Jesus Christ is preeminently the one who preaches the good news to the nations. Um, we 
have no authority to be able to the authority to, to, to do that, to take up that responsibility without some sort of charge or permission from France. All then have the possible to be commissioned in this way. You commission somebody to give somebody else a message on your behalf, you give them the message and you expect them to take the message and, and, and give it to the other person. You don't expect somebody else who happens to be standing by and half heard perhaps what you said, you don't expect that person to go and speak on your, on your behalf. You've not, you've not appointed them, you've not commissioned them, they're not your delegate, they're not, they have no authority from you to speak for you. Indeed, of course, that the other apostles and prophets of Paul said in chapter 2, verse 20, the church then is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets of Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So Paul went to preach the gospel to the nations not because he thought it was a good idea, not because he woke up one morning and thought, well, the Old Testament talks a lot about the gospel going to the nations, perhaps I ought to do something about this. I know what, I'll go and start preaching. One writer puts it in this way, it was not the case that Paul chose to have a mission for the nations on behalf of Israel's God. It was that the God of Israel chose Paul for his mission to the nations. Paul had a commission as well as a revelation And this is underlined in a very, very striking way, it seems to me, in Acts chapter 13, when Paul is preaching in the synagogue at Mycenaean Antioch. We have quite a lengthy account of his sermon there, and a little later it seems the Jews were objecting to him, and sadly they so often did. And he responds to them uh, in verse 46 of Acts 13, for the Barnabas answered them boldly, We have to speak the word of God to you first. But since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. And then he quotes from Isaiah, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah 49, verse 6. It's a messianic text. <coughs> I have made you a light for the Gentiles. We, we preach that rightly in relation to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We may bring salvation to the end of the earth. But what is Paul doing with that text here? He is applying it, it would seem, to himself, to the Bible. This messianic text. It's not a line, isn't it? But this is the work of Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus Christ did not finish, in one sense, with the work of the cross. Which, of course, salvation was complete. It was accomplished in all its fullness at the cross. Jesus died for the sins of all his people at that point. They were painful, and it was done. It was finished, and he rose from the dead. In that sense, his work was gloriously accomplished. <coughs> we were reminded earlier today. But uh, the work, as we said, the work of preaching then has to commence. And in that context, in that way, Paul very boldly, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes this messianic text from Isaiah about uh, the proclamation of salvation to the end of the earth. To himself and the apostles. Similarly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he says to the Corinthians, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We're familiar with that idea, aren't we? Then he goes on, as though, he says, as though God were making his appeal through us. That was Paul's understanding of his ministry. It wasn't just going off on a whim, it wasn't just his own idea. This was a good thing to do. He was commissioned by Christ to preach the gospel to the Gentiles in the name of Christ, for Christ, as though he said God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, therefore, he said, on Christ's behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So Paul had a revelation of the gospel, the message. He had a commission from Christ. And the third thing he had was an attitude of servanthood. I, I, I mentioned it, I think it's important in these verses, verse 1. As he introduces the subject, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. The prisoner of Christ Jesus. 
literally a prisoner, through the author, he, he's speaking of his sense that he's bound to the Lord Jesus Christ and that's his service. And for the faith, he says, of you Gentiles, for the faith of you Gentiles. His attitude was that of service. He was there to serve, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but to serve the people he was seeking to reach as well. Verse 7, he speaks of becoming a servant.
in massive conversion, which we assume, at least in some parts, to the fact that we don't have the same attitude of service and certainty that we have obviously had in the world. And this, of course, involves suffering. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 takes the certainty down, down the steps of suffering to the point where the Lord Jesus Christ dies, and he dies the shameful death of the cross. And again, this is reflected in the, in the life and experience of the Apostle Paul, and so from time to time in his letters we get a glimpse into what he suffered for Christ, and there in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, we have a whole catalogue of his sufferings that he is compelled, he doesn't want to do it, but he's compelled to give the list, isn't he, in order to demonstrate reality of his cause and the problem for those who are down. And earlier in the letter he kind of sums it up really, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10, he talks about the apostles carrying about in their body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus might also be manifest in the body. Servants of suffering went with this permission to preach the good news, the message that had been revealed to the Apostle Paul and to the other apostles and to engage in this task willingly, with zeal, with boldness, out of this all-consuming desire to serve his Saviour who had died for him. So then, thirdly, what about us today? There are no more apostles of this kind, of course. They died out in the first generation of the Christian church. But the work continues then, doesn't it? And it continues through, through us, through the Church of Jesus Christ. That continues from generation to generation. As we saw earlier, we are, we are members of his body. Uh, as reflecting earlier, as Phil was speaking uh, in the early part of his paper, referring to some of the opposition that uh, Admiral Judson and also William Perry in this country uh, faced. To, to the idea that we should be responsible in some part for taking the, the gospel to the heathen. And uh, 200 years ago or so then, perhaps I would need to argue in more detail that this is indeed the responsibility of the Church of Jesus Christ today. I hope in the light of the work of such men and subsequently we no longer have to argue for that. But we need, do need to remind ourselves, don't we, of the fact that uh, Nobody else is going to preach the gospel other than the church. Food banks, other works to help people socially, and so on, are, are good things. But uh, they're not things that the church exclusively is interested in doing. But nobody other than the church of Jesus Christ is interested in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the gospel is going to be preached and handed down to the next generation of Paul and visited, for example, the end of futility, uh, then it must be the church of Jesus Christ that does it. And so Paul and Peter in Colossians and in the first letter of Peter uh, urge believers to, to be ready, to be ready to give an answer to those who ask us about the hope that is within us. And Paul urges ministers in his first letter, in the second letter to Timothy, to, to do the work of the evangelist, to preach and to be ready in season and out of season. This work then that we've been considering, the work of taking the gospel to the nations, it's rooted in God's covenant, it's his eternal plan, he will see it accomplished, he will build his church undoubtedly, and the glorious vision that we saw earlier from Revelation chapter 7 will undoubtedly come to pass, but it will come to pass through the preaching of the gospel. Preaching that is primarily the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, but is carried on now through his body, the church, through us, his people. And so, as we carry on, seek to carry on this work, we seek to support missionary work, as we seek to evangelize in our own local <coughs> churches and communities, as we seek to preach evangelistically, as we seek to witness to our <coughs> colleagues and acquaintances. I want us to keep in mind these three aspects of the work that we saw in relation to the Apostle Paul. Firstly, revelation. We have
have no new revelation from Christ. But we have the revelation that Christ gave to his apostles. And if we're to preach the gospel to the nations, we must be absolutely clear and absolutely sure and certain in our own minds that we preach nothing other than the message that has been committed to us. That we have nothing to us. That we don't distort it in any way. That we take nothing from it. It's not our message, is it? We're just delegates, we're ambassadors. A message has been committed to us. And we are just to pass it on to others, unchanged, unaltered, undistorted, with nothing added, nothing taken away. And what does this tell us? What does tell us? We must study the scriptures, doesn't it? We must be those who consume the word of God. Listen to good preaching of the word. Go where you can hear the word of God preached. Read good literature that, 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 that helps us to understand the word of God. I happens to me sometimes when, when, when even men who are trained for the ministry say, say to me, well, you know, some of this literature is so difficult. It's hard. Okay. It's hard, but if, if, if a goal is worth achieving, is it worth putting some effort into? Worth reading material that is a little bit difficult to understand and follow if you're going to get thereby a better understanding of the scriptures. Read good literature, study the scriptures, listen to good preaching and teaching. Seek by God's grace to understand the word of God clearly. Get in your mind clearly the message of Jesus Christ committed to the apostles and that they have passed on to us. This should concern us, it seems to me. It doesn't seem to me that we are necessarily always doing this, respecting this always in our preaching. For example, do we sometimes, would it be true of us perhaps that we focus on the love of God at the expense of speaking very much about sin and hell? Are we clear in our preaching that justification is truly by faith alone? in Christ alone, to the complete exclusion of any works or merit of our heart, of our own. We emphasize the apostles did. The true saving faith will necessarily always lead to godly living. You can see those elements, those three elements, uh, here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, in the first half of the chapter, Paul speaks of our sinfulness, of our being by nature, children of wrath before we come to Christ. He speaks of the fact that salvation is by grace alone, through faith, and not of ourselves. And he reminds us that this faith leads to good works that God has prepared in advance for us to walk in. And then we focus in our preaching, and particularly in our evangelistic preaching, we focus on the life and the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we remind you what the Apostle Paul gives as a kind of summary of the Gospel message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says there, I want to remind you, brothers, that the Gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, is what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, appeared to various people. That's the full kind of summary, isn't it? Confession of the gospel that we preach. And in seeking to expand the scriptures to cover the entirety of the revelation that we have, we nevertheless focus on the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ as we seek to spread the good news of the gospel. That good news is rooted, isn't it, in those historic events. God has intervened in history. God has acted in our world, in time and space. We're not philosophers. We're not like some religions where it's all abstract, it's all philosophy, it's all ideas. We're not about that. We're about what God has done in time and space, in his Son, the only the Lord Jesus Christ, in his life and death and resurrection. And this we need to preach as we call men and women to repentance and faith in him. So let's keep in mind the revelation that we have.
definition that we have, that we are simply carrying out the charge that has been given to us by and up, by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not our work. We don't work primarily according to our plans and our strategies. We believe we need to think about our evangelistic work. We do need to make plans. We do need to strategize in one sense. But ultimately, it is God's plan. It is His work. He conceived of it. He originated it. He initiated it. He implemented it. He will bring it to its consummation. And so, when I hear some talk about the work of evangelism, begin to feel that they, they feel it's their work. It's all out of their control. It's all up to them. They talk about having a decade of evangelism, reaching the world in our generation, or other rather grandiloquent phrases. But let's remember that this is Christ's work. It's his work, and we're simply delegates. We simply commissioned by him to carry on the work in our little corner of the world. Yes, speaking to support others to go elsewhere. In our little locality, amongst our friends and relatives and acquaintances and contacts, in our community, seeking to do what we can to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you are called to preach. And you have a particular responsibility then in this area. And in your community, in your area, wherever it is that you are called to, where God has placed you, you have a particular responsibility to seek to bring the gospel to that community. Not simply, I suggest, to, to, to preach in your church building, in your church services, but to take the gospel out and reach others with it. But all of us, have, all of us as Christian believers, have a duty, don't we, as we have opportunity, to be ready to give an answer to the hope that is within us, to speak wild, wisely with those who are without, seasoning, seasoning our words. We have a commission. And finally, we're to do this as servants. As Paul did, as our Lord Jesus Christ did. And this means sacrificial, giving up our own interests for the sake of others. Again, servants sometimes hear quite a lot these days about how ministers need to rest and take a day off and look after themselves and not overexert themselves, and all of that is true. But you wonder sometimes, where is the spirit of a man like Jim Elliot, who says he is no fool, who gives what he cannot keep, to gain that which he cannot lose, and went on into the Amazon jungle with others to take the gospel to people who had never heard of it. Where is the zeal of the Apostle Paul, who endures beating after beating after beating for the sake of the gospel, who endures Roman imprisonment for the sake of the gospel, who was flogged several times for the sake of the gospel, and still he continues, and still he continues to preach. He says in Romans chapter 9 that he, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I myself was cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Do we have that sense of desire for the lost to reach them with the gospel? Are our strategies marked by heartfelt cries to God, fruitful evangelism? Do we plead with God to serve with his Holy Spirit that he may preach effectively to the conversion of souls? As we close, I'm struck by the fact that Paul ends chapter 3 with this extraordinary prayer that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they may know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. And this surely is at the root of everything we've been talking about. It's to reach others with the gospel, it's to be spreading the good news to the ends of the earth, and to be motivated by this by the fact that Christ dwells with us and that his love consumes us. And we seek him and pray to him that this may be so.
we in our generation may it indeed be the power of all the world. Let's think uh, 